Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by the new Squarespace. Squarespace introduces a new content management system, making it faster and easier to create a high quality website or blog. Plus, more than 50 new features, including mobile responsive designs with automatic device scaling. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase, go to squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE8. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Hey! I'm Bill Murray. I'm a man. I'm a god. I'm a celebrity. That's the deck. The record joke. I did some stuff. I'm a legend in this business. Read it in an article about myself. Ah! Ah! Ooh. Oh, wow. Wow. Oh. Ah! Yeah! Yeah! Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh. mm-hmm. Yeah, buddy, I'm crazy. Get crazy with me. There is something wrong up here. Nutballs. I'm right on the edge. I get it. You're taking me back in time. It's Frame Rate! Welcome to Frame Rate episode 90. I'm Tom Merritt. Howdy, folks. I'm Brian Brushwood. Hey, Tom, did you uh, did you catch who that was in that uh, in that opening video there? Uh, was that Brian Murray? Brian Doyle? No. I, I missed it as well. This was one that you picked. I, I went to go put something in the dock, and it was already there. You found it from Boing Boing? Yeah, I just saw it on Boing Boing today. It's uh, editing together all the Bill Murrayest moments of Bill Murray's film career. Uh, so Bill Murrayest is defined by him talking about how great he is for being Bill Murray. Yeah, well, I mean, you could in the editing, it makes it uh, it makes it that way, absolutely. And I'm, sure. I don't know about you, I'm a big fan. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he could do no wrong. Are you yeah. kidding me? Exactly. Uh, joining us today, Brian... Uh, we're very happy to have Amber J. Lawson, chairman of the IAW TV Awards. How's it going, Amber J.? Awesome. Hi, guys. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us today. You, as a matter of fact, are the big story today. This just in, the big story. Big story, as we mentioned last week, uh, IAW TV Awards are open for submission. Uh, and Amber J., you have the gargantuan task of coordinating this whole thing, don't you? <laughs> yeah, it's not a small feat. Uh, as you know, we partnered with CES, so it's in the biggest forum, uh, combining technology and content together in Vegas, in the Venetian showroom, where we get to celebrate uh, content creators um, and their visions coming to fruition and awarding them with uh, awards. A great night of celebration for the entire industry. So your role is, is not only getting people to submit, uh, but you, do you oversee the whole selection process, the nominees, all of that right up to the, the actual ceremony? Right. So we, we have a committee of IAW TV members who have come together who you know, in essence, create the the actual form of the show. And uh, last year and then this year, we have built the, what is the IAW TV Awards. You saw the live stream last year, and um, this year will be even bigger and better. And to answer your question, yes, we open submissions, and then all the way through the voting process, the nomination process, and then the final voting and announcement of the awards, which is January 8th, uh, 2013, in the Venetian showroom. So this is fascinating to somebody like me because the whole reason I got involved with new media is because it's always great to be at the ground floor of something. Now, part of the problem with being at the ground floor means that nobody's entirely sure what the thing is. But as it grows, as it gains an audience, as it finds its own voice, you also find the the, the trappings that come along with the success of certain things. And so uh, we have previously on the show talked about how important award ceremonies are like these for legitimizing in the public's mind the perception of new New media in general. Uh, I guess a couple of questions here. Uh, number one, how many years does this make for you guys doing the award ceremony? And number two, how have you evolved what you guys look for and how you want to represent the awards? 
Sure. So we've been around. This will be our second uh, awards show. And the organization, the nonprofit organization of the IAWTV, which stands for the International Academy of Web Television, so that's the whole world, um, is been around since uh, 2009. And, you know, it's for creators by creators. And frankly, since 2009, we've seen a huge evolution of what online video means, um, the categories, you know, expand. We have a deeper understanding um, and and clear things to award. And that will continually evolve over time. You know, uh, the way we came up with our new three categories this year, uh, which is best live event, best ensemble and best online channel was the demand in the marketplace. So uh, we listened to what everybody kind of said after the awards last year. They wanted these awards. And uh, so we listened and we added them in. Um, also, with the expansion of the, uh, you know, clearly YouTube's investment into this space, there is a huge expansion of content uh, and players in the space to get involved in the nonprofit community. So, this is for creators, by creators. We are the nonprofit organization representing this space and hopefully a, a hub for uh, creators to all congregate around, to educate, to support, to grow, to share ideas. And then clearly this is our fundraiser of the year to to raise funds and grow our organization. Now, I, I have had a few people get excited about this. They go and they find out that there's a submission fee. Can you sort of explain why there is a charge to nominate? Because I think on the web, a lot of people are used to that just being free and open. Sure. So it's $95 for non-members and $45 for uh, active IAW TV members. So you can become a member uh, and uh, get the reduced rate. And for that $45 or $95, you get five submissions. So you're looking at um, I'm not a mathematician, but nine dollars per. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a reasonable amount. And then if you need to add on top of that, uh, it's only ten dollars per additional category or or add on to your submission. Well, and, and I suppose uh, viewers at home should keep in mind that this is not an automated system. It's not like some uh, name just gets added to a web survey and whoever clicks on it wants to click on it. What, you, what you're paying for is uh, manual curation. You have actual people reviewing the materials and trying to decide which is their favorite. Is that correct? Well, I'm glad you brought this up. David Nett, who is an IAW TV member and uh, master coder, has put together... Uh, a proprietary uh, submission and then voting system, nomination system, that is the fairest I've ever seen um, in any organization. So it's a randomized uh, uh, process that brings uh, the various categories up to the forefront and then the active members vote. So not only is it great to get a cheaper submission price, to enter your projects, but also the members of the IAWTV are the are the folks who vote on all of the nomin you know the potential nominees. So it is it is the members, it's the creators. There is no kind of filter beyond that uh, who get to vote for who the final nominees, and then ultimately who wins. How big is the uh, IAW TV, TV? Did I say it right? I'm such <laughs> yeah. an idiot. It's a lot of letters. Yeah. So we're at about 600 members right now, and it's ever expanding. Usually, you know, Frank, kind of obviously through this process, uh, it tends to attract more members during the submission and voting process. So, um, you know, we're always expanding <laughs> internationally. And intergalactically. I know last week you were talking about um, Curiosity Mars, so maybe from Mars. 
And and the the money that people pay does that go to just generally fund IWTV, which is a nonprofit, like you said, or is it particularly for the ceremony and for operating the awards? How does that break out? Great, great question. The submission cost literally covers the price of the trophies, so um, it, it it goes right into the production of the awards. And as I mentioned before, the event itself is the main fundraiser for the operating of the IAW TV, which is a 99% volunteer organization. Um, We have a new creative director who, uh, or sorry, executive director. Uh, Her name is Sherry Covens, um, who, you know, gets paid a stipend. She's our only part-time hired person in the IAW TV and, and uh, she has a huge, huge, never-ending job to run this community. So we actually got a fantastic question from the chat room just now. Caffeine Free Dave says uh, he keeps getting called away and he wanted to know, did he miss it? Or have you said whether or not the ceremony will be streamed? And if so, where people can watch it. Are you guys doing that yet? Absolutely. We're going to absolutely stream it live. It will be, uh, I'm sure you'll find the link on the IWTV Awards dot org site um as well as uh on our youtube channel which is iaw tv so this is this is interesting to me because you guys not only have to worry about the the actual selection you know the 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 voting from internally from everyone but also when you put on anything that's live streamed anything that's going out to the masses you're really putting on a show have you guys thought about i mean what does it take to put together an entertaining package because obviously you know the oscars is a tremendous draw in the world of of uh, you know uh, on television about the movies likewise with the emmys are you guys what goes through your mind when it comes to scheduling things to to add some flair to make it a interesting live event? That's a great question because our biggest hurdle last year was making sure we had an efficient, entertaining, streamlined show. And our, my goal was to pull it off in 90 minutes. We pulled it off in an hour and 45 minutes, so I don't think we went too far Did over. You- it's for the one ceremony, I think that's within the variances. I, I think yes. that's right. I mean, how many Academy Awards have we sat there that were like, oh, you know, like so long? So um, it was really uh, about celebrating each of the categories. There wasn't a second show that was the, you know, a different award show. You know, it the all of the categories that we celebrate were in the main show. And we gave away 34 awards last year. And we have 34 categories this year that we'll be giving out in 90 minutes. 90 minutes. <laughs> yes. Or it's free. Well, do There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's a, a, it's a, a great uh, organization. Of course, Tech News Today was was honored to to win in the news category last year. And we'll, we'll submit again. And you guys should admit as well, if you're, if you're someone who makes web video, uh, and 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 you can cough up the fee. You've got till September 19th to go to IAWTVAwards.org. That's where you can get all the links, all the information you need to know. Keep in mind that uh, this is a nonprofit organization, uh, so you can you can probably deduct this from your taxes, uh, the the sort of fees. I know I do. Uh, so if 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 it's uh, if it's at all well, worth presu- being involved also- in something like this, you should do it. You know, presumably also, if you're a content producer, if you're somebody who feels like you're qualified to even apply for the IAWTV uh, award, then presumably you would be tax deducting the rest of your expenses to do that, right? Yeah, sure. (laughs) I don't know. I'm not a tax attorney. (laughs) (laughs) You were telling me the other day, you said, Brian, as a tax attorney, I can full on (laughs) explain to you that yes, this is fully deductible. That Trust me, Tom Merritt. I know that the uh, the fee, because I'm an IAW TV member, uh, and I know that the membership fee... Is tax deductible as well, yeah. but anyway, this is this is not this is it's not, this is not financial business. accounting today. Uh, yeah, like, if, if you run your own business, anytime that you're a member of a professional organization, you can usually ta- tax deduct it, and, and that's coming from me, Brian Brushwood, tax attorney. And you get the you discounted definitely... you get the discounted submission fee, right? If you're a member, and you have you can still become a member until when? Till September seventeenth, right? And be eligible to vote on the awards. Exactly. So become a member. It saves you money. Yeah. I mean, I think bottom line and, then um, you get and, to help and 
I would just say that, you know, there is a category for everybody. It is uh, open across all, uh, anything that's online, I, there's a category that will fit it. So uh, please submit Absolutely. I, I second well, that. And uh, Amber J, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about this. And good luck with the awards. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys, for spreading the word. And uh, get your submissions in. Will do. All right. All right. Bye. Take care. That's what I, 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 We're in. We're submitted. We're I'll good. tell you what, man. Uh, after talking to her and hearing more about it, I actually, because, you know, there's a bunch of podcasts that, that I do, and I've got this bizarre, unfair perception that it's like, oh, I'm just dumb old Brian Brushwood. I can't do nothing worthy of no Academy Award. And uh, But after hearing it, it's just like, what the hell, man? It's, it's what, 90, 90 bucks? And I could submit all. I could submit weird things, could submit, uh, you know, NSFW, uh, Scam School, all these other shows. And why not, dude? Let's throw more stuff in the mix. Get in there. All right, meanwhile, we've got other stuff going on in the world of web video, including another big story about Hulu. Stop everything. It's another big story. So an internal memo from July has been leaked. Uh, there's a lot of uh, analysis of what's going on in this memo, especially regarding the fact that it, it seems to refer to Jason Killar, the CEO of Hulu, stepping down, some kind of transition period. So that's getting a lot of attention. But there's also a lot of detail in here about Hulu's plans for the future uh, and some of it changing Hulu from being a place where you go to access all the TV online uh, to reducing the exclusivity of Hulu so that, you know, the, the networks that are involved would be able to have exclusives outside of Hulu and be able to direct people back to their websites more often. Yeah, I got to admit, out of the two sides of this story, I tend to not be so interested as far as, like, who's in what job position at what. So I, I sort of tune out on that, although I did think it was interesting. And it makes sense for as much as Jason has invested in Hulu and been there through the entire thing that they would say, let us let us work out a transition where, you know, options fully vest and so on so that he can get his his payout, I guess, would be a way to, way to put it on his way out the door. But this other side of the coin... I got to admit, it's going to be big changes for Hulu, and I'm going to say not for the best. If Hulu two years ago could have gotten the jump on securing these license agreements and becoming essentially the Internet's television, like essentially positioning itself not as a network but as a portal to all of the networks, then you know we could have seen something super simple that brought old-school television-like interface and massive custom customization to the Internet but instead, you know, obviously the whole scape of the new media landscape landscape has changed, as as the article on GigaOM points out, or maybe it was uh, All Things D. Uh, they were saying that um, you know the networks are not terrified of Vimeo and of YouTube and all of these various services now, and so now they're working out their own deals, and so now we see this giant fragmentation, and there's some part of me. That on the one hand is happy because everyone's the content owners are in more control of what they're up to. But another part of me felt like in that chaos, in that confusion, somebody had the chance to essentially bring the simplicity of traditional television to the Internet. And I feel like that window's closed now. It is interesting, right? Because Hulu was born out of, of fear and arrogance. Fear and yes. anger, maybe, would be a better way of putting it. Uh, the, the networks saw what YouTube was doing. And where Viacom sued, the networks said, oh, no, we're going to crush YouTube. Their little right. cat videos won't survive when we put our programming on the internet and make money off of it. And Jason Kalar and the entire team of Hulu came in and did a fantastic job setting up a service that took best advantage of all of that content, which is fantastic. And what has happened yeah. is the networks have now said, oh, wait a minute. YouTube isn't so bad. Maybe we overreacted. Oh, look at that. We were wrong. People do want to watch longer form content on YouTube in addition to the skateboarding dog videos. Oh, maybe we want a piece of that action. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe we shouldn't be cooperating with each other. Maybe we should be putting all of these videos on our own websites. Maybe we misunderstood this entirely. Meanwhile, Jason Kalar and team are getting frustrated because they're not allowed to fulfill on the vision of making that web portal that you're talking about. It's no surprise then that Kilar might want out. Uh, and that he would say, look, I, I want a graceful exit, uh, and then you guys can do whatever you want with this. And, and what GigaOM is saying is that News Corp wants to double down on authentication. Uh, Fox shows would start showing up 
with an eight-day delay on Hulu unless you authenticated as a cable subscriber, and then you would get them faster. Uh, Disney wants nothing to do with authentication. Uh, they actually uh, want to give subscribers access to content on their own websites. They're, they're wanting to say, look, we want to put our stuff everywhere. We don't want to be limited to putting things just on Hulu. Uh, so even the partners, the major partners in Hulu, can't agree on what it should be. Do you think it's doomed? Well, here's the thing is, it's like looking at it, I don't blame any party for doing things the way they're doing it. Because if I, the entire market is in chaos. That's why this show exists is because we are watching this complete dust up of the way people consume their media. And nobody knows. I mean, we all have feelings. Even you and I could talk about as consumers what we wish stuff would be. But meanwhile, we're not the content owners in the positions that a Disney or an ABC or a NBC or a Fox is. So nobody knows what the right decision is is going to be on paper i would have told you five years ago that the way uh that that making people buy pricing your content so that it forced more people to buy episodes of television the way itunes did is a terrible idea but yet here we are five years later and now i'm i'm freaking i'm so lazy that i'd rather spend the three bucks to just get the episode instantly rather than walk all the way over to my living room to play the exact same recorded episode of Breaking Bad over in the other room to bring my wife up to speed. It's it's uh, nobody knows what the right answer is, but we're in a place now where at least everybody is commanding their own. Who knows? Maybe it's better that you, Hulu didn't explode and didn't didn't make internet television simple because that definitely would have come with some onerous terms to the content owners. And I got to come down on the side of more free choice, both for content owners and for consumers. Well, it, but, very- the, but, but I, I, the only reason I quibble with you on that is the content owners are also the owners of Hulu. So it's sort of like if they did it that way, it would have been their own fault. I, yeah. I, I think that the restrictions that you're talking about are the problem. I think Hulu has only been not more successful. Uh, that's a horrible sentence. The only reason... <laughs> <laughs> Hulu has not been more successful is because they have, play, they have placed these restrictions, because they have feared the future that Kalar and Friends put out there. I think the reason I have problems with Hulu Plus and its weird, seemingly random restrictions are because of the restraints that Kalar has been put under. I think what would have been smarter and might still be smarter would be to give Jason Kalar and his team free reign, wall off Hulu as a separate organization, even though it's still got an investment uh, from ABC and News Corp and Comcast, and say, you're now in competition. We are going to not give you exclusive licenses unless we negotiate them. You're not going to get an advantage, but go do whatever you want. Make Hulu a huge success and drive this market for, for us. But instead, what they're doing is gutting it and actually putting more restrictions on it and more authentication. And Hulu is not going to be a success. And they're, they're kind of blowing the advantage they would have had. Yeah, and I think I think Hulu had the chance to become a network, and instead they become a dumb pipe, another conduit by which uh, the real networks could decide what, uh, you know, another tool for the big networks to use. Uh, in a world, let's let's go into imaginary fantasy land where Hulu was able to negotiate, uh, you know, all of a sudden all the deals, and everyone was watching Hulu like they were watching TV. Then an independent content creator could go to Hulu and negotiate for uh, for distribution over Hulu, and it would be a really big deal, and it would be empowering theoretically to to this independent contour, uh, uh, this independent content creator. But now it's like, well, I mean, what's the point of even talking to Hulu? It's just uh, I I don't know. It's it's I, I'm more wrapped up in what might have been right now than where we actually are because I mean, who knows where we're headed? And that's extraordinarily sad because of yet another big story about the rate of people watching video. Tuck in your bootstraps, it's yet another big story. Viewers in the United States alone watched 36.9 billion online videos in July. That's five videos per person around the world, but we're just talking about US numbers here. Google, far and away the leader, uh, with over 156 billion of those 36.9 billion. Facebook, number 253 billion. Uh, then it goes Yahoo, Vivo, Microsoft, AOL, Viacom, NDN, Amazon, and Turner. You know who I don't see there? Hulu. Oh my goodness, you're right. How is that possible? Because that's... what people do on Vivo, what people do on Facebook, what people do on YouTube, which is Google, is watch a bunch of clips. 
And what people don't do on Hulu is watch a bunch of clips. Right, right. No, 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 that's a good point. Because obviously uh, Hulu, I guess we also don't, do we see, Do uh, we don't see Netflix on there either, do we? No, absolutely not. And that's a subscription service. So I would expect it would have lower numbers of, of, of viewers because of that, because that is a gatekeeper. But Hulu has a free version. It's still not up there. Of course, there's also a, uh, a note out that YouTube viewers watched 231 million streams during the London Olympics. And remember, most of those streams happened in August. So those aren't in this 36.9 billion number that we're talking about from July. It's only it's going to get bigger in August. That is phenomenal. Uh, I, I'm utterly shocked by by less the the total number of videos because that's something we've suspected for a long time is that uh, online video is is popular and is only going to get more popular. But the fact that that what I perceive as the biggest players in the game aren't even on this list is is really shocking to me. And and again. People are watching short form stuff still. This is not 30 minute episodes. This is more your your Vivo sites with music videos. And 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 there's another story out today saying that teens watch their music on YouTube. They go to YouTube for but, music. But on the flip side, look at the average minutes per viewer or the minutes per viewer total. Uh, Google sites all told, you're looking at this is monthly views, right? 525 minutes per viewer, uh, that's more time than some people spend speaking on their cell phones. Well, yeah, and that, that's for the whole month, so we don't know what it is minutes per clip. But you're right, it's a big number. Yeah. We well, love to waste our time. I mean, I say waste our time, but consume our media in a novel way. On, well, the, on, and, and frankly, the number pales next to the number of minutes spent watching television. Yes, but still, it's growing. The story is, is yeah. that it's growing and will continue to grow. And, of course, we here at Frame Rate are very excited about that. If you would like to grow a new website, what you need is an operation. Actually, no, you don't need that. No, you don't no, need I know any this. surgery. I know Tom, 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 I know all this. If you want a website, what you got to do is you got to pay thousands of dollars to some no. kid who understands no, these no. HTMLs. I don't understand all this stuff. You don't, no, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that at all. You just, uh, you like just go to, of dollars a month. you go to I've, squarespace.com and for free, you don't even have to give them a credit card. You just create huh? a website to begin with. Uh, huh. and, and then, and then if you like it, you'll pay a little bit, but, but you're, you're not going to pay as much what? as even a regular Squarespace person. Cause you're going to use our offer code, uh, frame rate eight. But, but yeah, I mean, it's super simple. You just go and you, you say, I want these colors. I want this layout. The new Squarespace allows you to drag and drop. They have these beautiful templates. Uh, you just say, yeah, put this picture up here. I want some trees. I want this kind of font. I'm going to drag these pictures in here, make a gallery, and, and I'm off to the races. They have, they have blinking text. I don't know if they have the blink tag. But you know what? You can get under the hood and modify the HTML. So if any browsers out there still support it, you, you, you could use the blink tag probably. What about that animated GIF of the guy, cartoon guy who walks out and then he pees on whatever thing is? Sure, the... yeah. No, you could just drag that in. That's a, just a just an image. You could put that in there if you really needed to. Like, yeah. Like sparkly background like an animated guy? Sure, uh, yeah. Under construction sign. File. A MIDI file that plays Magical Mystery Tour in the you, background. You know, you, you probably don't need a MIDI. You could you could just put an MP3 in there. They've got an MP3 player that works mm -hmm. really well. Um, Is it optimized for IE3? When's the last time you designed a website? It's, it's been a while. Uh, yeah, it's you might want to try Squarespace and just play around with the templates and let them show you what a good website looks like. Ah, huh. all right. Well, I'll check it out. Yeah, uh, squarespace.com. Sign up for a free account. Like I said, you don't need a credit card. If you decide to purchase it, use the offer code FRAMERATE8. You'll get 10% off your first purchase on new Squarespace accounts, including monthly and annual plans. So if you buy the annual plan, you actually save 10% off the entire year. And don't forget, with an annual plan, you get free domain name registration. That's squarespace.com. Use that offer code FRAMERATE8. And we thank them for their support of FRAMERATE. Yeah. On to the tube. Ta -da -da, the slipstream. First, the slipstream. Phew. Thank you. Actually, pretty much all of our news is in the slipstream. Uh, the Department of Justice and the FCC have cleared Verizon to buy out the cable company Spectrum. Uh, that's, that's the airwaves that they use to broadcast. This is great news for Verizon Wireless, but the reason we're mentioning it on frame rate is that it also means that they approved in areas where Verizon doesn't already operate television service, Verizon can resell the cable company's TV service, which kind of takes away an incentive for Verizon to roll out Fios TV in those markets. Well, uh, I mean, but, but the difference we're talking about as far as uh, bandwidth capability between something like Fios versus, I mean, is or I, I should ask you, I'm just making an assumption here, is 
broadcast bandwidth anywhere near enough to satisfy consumers for who, who have tasted 50 megabits down Fios? Uh, Brian, let me ask you this. Would you like a 50 megabit connection in your house or a cell phone? Like, I can only have one? Yeah, if you were to choose. Yeah, I'd rather have a cell phone because that goes with me anywhere. Yeah, but what about bandwidth? Making the decision strictly on bandwidth. Oh, Like, well, your then, only uh, internet connection in your house to watch all your streaming video is oh. going to be your cell phone. Well, then, duh, Fios. Yeah, there you, you go. Yeah. 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 So that that's the, I mean, wired bandwidth, not comparable to wireless bandwidth at this point. So, yeah, this is great news for Verizon wireless customers because there's going to be more spectrum. That'll ease congestion. Uh, Verizon will have an easier time rolling out for wireless customers. But for actual, actual like, watching TV at home customers, you're, you'd rather have fiber. Uh, and Verizon's, I, you know, I, we can't say for sure, but they have less incentive to expand their markets. And they have said in the past, we're done expanding Fios markets. We're not rolling out to any new markets now. What? When did they say this? They say, I- they've said that a few, uh, like a year ago. No. They said, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're not, uh, not going to spend money on that infrastructure for now. Boo. Well, then I guess I have to pray to Google now for a while and hope they come to Austin. Yeah, uh, especially with this because, again, great for Verizon Wireless to get some spectrum. Uh, but if they can resell Comcast, then they've got a TV service. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's still not an Internet service. Maybe they'll still want to roll out Fios and just not provide a TV service over Fios. I don't know. That's fine. Yeah. Just, just give me the bandwidth. I, I hope want they the do that. Bits. I want to know where the bit's at. Netflix is also bit. making TV show marathons easier with a new post-play feature that's kind of like what you get on TV when they squeeze the credits down and they show you the preview for the next episode, except what it does is it squeezes the credits down and then it shows you, like, your options for playing the next episode. So if you're watching season four, episode 13... When that episode goes into credits, it squeezes down into the corner, and then well, it shows you the link in the description to the next episode. It's, it's not just that, but it also autoplays the next episode within a certain time. It's like you got to do something to stop it from skipping over the rest of the credits and jumping you over to the next episode, which is something I noticed, and we'll talk about this in what we're watching, but uh, H+, Plus, I watched all of those episodes And they built a playlist where it skips over the credits on that as well. So that's a case not only where the only way to get mad at at Netflix is is to say, hey, man, these people worked on the episode. They deserve to be forced to have people watch it or they have to take action to skip over them. But meanwhile, you've got the case of H+, building their playlist from the beginning to say, yes, yes, nobody cares about the credits. And immediately starting the the next chapter each time. Although sometimes they give you a little bonus content after the credits. So I wonder how that works. Oh, man, that would be annoying, actually, if there yeah. was little little tidbits in there. Now, I know what people in Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland are saying right now, which is, we don't care about your Netflix because we don't get it here. Well, guess what? You're getting it in late 2012. You're going to get it this year. Netflix bringing their service to Scandinavia. Woo! There you go. Which, uh- uh, I wonder if they'll immediately start with all of Lillehammer available. I guess so. That's a good question because Lillehammer was actually on TV In Norway. It was interesting to see tweets from fans of this show saying, you know, I haven't seen Lilyhammer. I wonder how it ends. I was like, wait, don't you have Netflix? And they're like, no, screw you. I'm from Norway. (laughs) Watch it in order. I'm from Lilyhammer, actually. And I can't watch Lilyhammer. Yes, exactly. That's that's, uh, is that irony? (laughs) That's not irony, is it? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's odd, though. Uh, Fox and HBO have struck a deal uh, that will allow Fox movies to show up on the HBO Movie Channel, but it also means that Fox will be able to sell their movies as digital purchases sooner. Because we, we've talked about this ad nauseum, the windowing that goes on and says, no, HBO has the exclusive right, so you have to pull that movie off of Netflix, you have to pull that movie out of the iTunes store, you can't have it for sale yet. This changes that. So this is, this is what we need to happen, is that as these deals come up for renegotiation, the studios to say, okay, HBO, yeah, you, you'll get that movie, And you'll be the only movie channel on TV to have it, but we're still going to sell it in the iTunes store and the Amazon store and all the other stores. Now, do you think this is a case of them trying to continue to slip these things under the radar uh, in the in the early days of digital media? Or it's a case where finally we are establishing a a market value for a digital release versus a DVD release versus a 
uh, theatrical release. Is this a case of the market being more efficient or of somebody getting something good because it's still less efficient? No, I, I think this is a sign of, of, of efficiency. It's certainly not the, the best sign. I mean, they're not allowing rentals. It's not the end of the windowing system. HBO right. still has the exclusive on streaming and on demand, right? So Netflix isn't going to get any of these movies while HBO has them. You're not going to see them available for rental in any of the stores. But I think what it is is Fox saying, hey, our DVD sales are going into the toilet. We think we might be able to make it up on digital sales. At least it's our best hope. So HBO, if you want our movies, you, we won't budge on digital sales because that's our bread and butter. Any more than we would budge on DVD sales in the old times. That's the new reality. Take it or leave it. And HBO says, all right, but you have to give us exclusivity on streaming. You have to give us exclusivity on on demand. And Fox is willing to allow that for now. So it's, and it's, I think, it's, I think it's, it's a pressure being felt. Uh, and imagine this, man, a decade ago, would you even really differentiate or would the industry really differentiate between streaming on demand and digital distribution? Like to like at the time, it was all like, I don't know, that's all computer BS. You know, well, it and was it was, was pay-per-view and DVD sales. Right. We're just translating those into an into streaming and and per, and digital purchases. Right. Correct. Correct. Uh Interestingly, HBO also, the article up on All Things D about the show Hard Knocks uh, not being available on HBO Go. And the reason is because of these digital distribution rights, HBO co-produces the show with NFL Films. NFL Films owns the digital rights, including mobile rights. And under the terms of the contract, HBO Go is considered a mobile service, even if that's not how you use it. That's what it's considered contractually. And so Hard Knocks does not appear on HBO Go, even though it's an HBO show. I'll tell you what, man, and this is this is just a separate, just uh, allow me this temporary diversion. It is such a betrayal that uh, that get, signing up for the LTE service on my iPad finally makes it possible for me to stream high quality movies like on Netflix or HBO Go. But perversely, those are the two things that I would never dare to do on my LTE iPad because I can't afford to spend the bandwidth on it. So it's like it's just uh, it is a mobile service and it should be it could be a mobile service, but it's kind of not. Well, when you're home, you're supposed to use the Wi-Fi. Yes, exactly. But if you're I'm doing home, it wrong. But OK, but if I'm home, then I have a living room that probably has access to all this exact same on demand HBO content. No, because it's a mobile service. OK. All right. Screw you. That's <laughs> next. Story. And, and, and I, as the industry, I, I think deservedly uh, need that comment directed at me. Yeah, because that's essentially right. what's going on. Uh, but right. good news. HBO and Blinkbox are offering the second season of Game of Thrones online before DVD and Blu-ray release in the UK. Now, what does this mean? Because does it mean, Good I question. mean, what we're seeing in general is that people are giving more and more respect to uh, online as a revenue source and for digital distribution as a revenue source. But does this mean that they are trying to goose sales of digital by offering it before DVD, the traditional formats? It, or is it a case where, where they... They believe that this is a premium way to consume the content. And as a result, part of the premium and experience is going first. I have two suspicions. One is it's probably, and this is my favorite of the suspicions, it's probably just uh, an experiment, right? It's just uh, HBO saying, well, let's see what impact it has on sales. We'll use the UK as a test. It's a good, robust market, but it's limited. Uh, and, and find out if it really does impact the sales of DVD and Blu-rays or if it outstrips them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other idea is that maybe there's some loophole in a contract somewhere that says you're not allowed to sell DVDs of this until we've run these reruns. And HBO says, yeah, but it doesn't say anything about digital. Take it away, Blinkbox. We'll make some money. Ah, uh, interesting. Could be one or both of those or neither. I, I don't know, but yeah. that is pretty interesting. Uh, and finally, uh, Warner Brothers has secretly, or at least quietly, extended the expiration date of digital copies that you get on DVDs. So digital copies, usually iTunes copies, but not always, uh, that you buy on DVD expire after a certain amount of time. And we've, we've had people write in uh, uh, upset about this in the past, saying, hey, I finally got around to downloading that digital copy that came free with my DVD, and it says it doesn't work anymore. Warner Brothers has extended the expiration date on a bunch of these, according to Engadget. I wonder, 
I wonder how much of this has to do. I mean, you were tying it to iTunes, but when I read this, I immediately thought of Ultraviolet because everything well, I'm seeing. That's why I said not just iTunes, but also Ultraviolet. It may be that it's only the Ultraviolet ones that got extended. Well, and I wonder, I know that, that, that Warner Brothers has publicly talked about their commitment to the Ultraviolet platform, but meanwhile, like, we haven't heard about Ultraviolet in a long time. And we, of course, accuse them of, of really mangling the message to the consumers as far as what ultraviolet can do and what the service means and i wonder if this isn't a way for them to sort of push the goalpost back a little bit be like let's just punt and you know i'm, I'm mixing up my sports although moment. i should point out the engadget story says that streaming support now available for many of these digital copies through icloud so obviously some of these are the itunes versions yes yes but uh but i think this is a case where where it's whatever whatever's happening out there and i'm, I'm gonna pin this on ultraviolet I, there's no basis for me to Dude, this is pure conjecture on my part, but I suspect that that whatever's happening with getting everyone on board with with ultraviolet is taking longer than it should. And part of their strategy to grant a little more time is to just extend everything a little bit farther. Let's move on to tube tops. Now, granted, tube tops a little bit of a misnomer. We're talking about the devices you use to get the video you want to watch onto your TV. TVs are very thin these days. You can't actually set the boxes on top of your television or they will fall off. So Ironically, please. Though, TVs are so thin that you actually can place tube tops on them. Yeah, like, I, after oddly enough. Down. So I just wanted to give that disclaimer because we don't want to get sued by people trying. Like, well, I heard it was called tube tops and I kept trying to set it on top I and it fell balancing. over. Yeah, sure. that's yeah, not that, what that, this means. Uh, we really only have one story to talk about this week, and that was the end of the week last uh, week. Wall Street Journal reporting what we've talked about before, Brian, which is Apple really trying hard to get a cable company to join up with them on the Apple television, the Apple TV. We're not talking about the Apple TV box that's available now for purchase, but this rumored Apple television that would, would totally solve the television industry. And yeah. all, of the, all of the reports, and the Wall Street Journal report being, being the main one, sort of implied that what Apple wants to do is get rid of the idea of a schedule and you just get shows and you watch them when they're available, whether it's on demand or whether they're live. They would, they would break down that distinction. Well, essentially, we're talking about like a curated DVR experience. So imagine if the, the thing is we have the technology of the DVR and we have the rights laid out with what you're allowed to do with your DVR. But the only problem is, is I don't want to be bothered to program my DVR anymore. And if technologically they could create this sort of a, this sort of cloud based concierge service that basically like uh, whatever it is you think you want. Don't worry, I recorded it for you. And all of a sudden it creates, and how long have we, you know, I thought personally that Google TV was going to be the savior in this regard. I, I, I wanted the Apple TV the first time I bought it to be this. And maybe this could be the actual thing where all of a sudden you honestly don't know if what you're watching is time shifted by 30 minutes or by a week all you know is like, oh, you got to see Breaking Bad season five, episode eight. And then you go on and you tune in and then and, and that's what you want. It's like there's no benefit to the consumer to know what channel something's on or what time it comes on or have to program something in advance. And like, oh, you didn't know that you were going to like this before it came out. And so as a result, you didn't think to, to upload, to configure it. And to wipe all that away would be magic. And to be honest. The, I would have thought for this to be the big story for this week, except for that then we would have nothing in tube tops. So I'm glad it's in <laughs> That's tube pretty much why it's, <laughs> it is where it is. That's a good little behind the scenes uh, detail there. But, but yeah, I mean, it, it really is the only set top box story people are talking about this week. And I wonder if even Apple can get a cable company to sign off on this. I mean, they have done this over and over again. The, the, the music industry was resistant. They got one record label to sign up, and then they were able to get the rest of the labels to sign up for iTunes. Same thing was repeated with iCloud. Uh, it happened even slower with television. Remember when they launched with television, all they had was Disney uh, on board for selling TV shows, and then they got NBC, and they actually launched the thing without having all the networks on board. Eventually, they got all the networks on board. I feel like they only need one cable company to get this going and then once everybody loves it then all the cable companies will feel the pressure to to get on board and have it but how do you get a cable company to do that because it turns them into a dumb pipe and that's exactly what they do not want to be 
Well, so try this on for size and tell me legally. This is this as you know, the our whole show is Brian says what he'd like it to be and Tom explains why that would be illegal. Uh what if and let's say for one channel at first. Let's say they partner with AMC and what if what they sell is a uh, an ultimate cloud-based DVR that every single piece of content at any time ever put out on AMC is available to you, complete with the commercials and everything. It's just like you DVR'd it, only you don't have to know in advance what it was you wanted to watch. So now all of a sudden, everything is available in all of AMC. Anything AMC put out for the last month is available to you instantly on demand uh, as a DVR type experience. Now, granted, you'll have to fast forward through the commercials yourself, but now all of a sudden you don't have to know what time a show comes on. You don't have to know uh, in advance whether or not you'd like it because it's all retroactively allowed with, with AMC. That would be such a valuable thing to me that I would love that I can't imagine that once the reactions were seen that other channels wouldn't want to hop on since essentially... It's it's exactly the DVR experience, but just more of it. So if they're okay with DVRs, why not be okay with universal cloud-based DVRs that record everything and make everything available? Uh, it's not a question of legality at all. Uh, but if AMC is an interesting example, right? You're not on Dish Network right now, AMC, and you're feeling it. You're a yes. little you're a little worried about how long this is going to go on. Now you announce that you've partnered with Apple to be the premier channel on Apple TV where people can just watch AMC. You are immediately dumped or have your rates slashed at every cable operator who says, well, "Why should I pay you full rate when you're you're selling direct to people? You're you're just going to undercut the demand of people who love AMC to come to my cable network. We're not going to we're not going to uh, pay you as much as we pay you anymore." That's why a TV channel would be hesitant to, do, to just go and do that. Huh. All right. Well, that'll be interesting. Yeah, I, I exactly. Just, and that's what I'm saying. You need a cable operator to get on board. Uh, I mean, because uh, Roku and plenty of other devices have tried this, like, let's get channels to do this. And what they get is they end up with channels that can't get distribution on regular cable because they have less of a risk, right? You don't God. get the big channels to do it. So what it, Apple needs to do is say, hey, Dish, or hey, Direct TV, or hey, Cable Vision, Bright House, somebody who's a little lower down on the pole. Let's make you cool, and and give you this device. But even so, the cable operators are like, yeah, but I saw what happened to the margins at Sprint when they got the iPhone. I don't want that to happen to me. But imagine, like, let's say you're t you're dealing with Time Warner, right? And what if? essentially, I guess what I'm proposing, and I, I think this is going to be far off from whatever we see, whatever we see is going to be crippled and stupid and make me mad. But imagine if Time Warner universally made an agreement with Apple TV where it's like all of Time Warner, all the programming is one giant pipe yeah, of right. No, I get what you're saying. If Time Warner agrees to that, it's the game is over. That's the yes. other reason nobody wants to blink first, because they know that they are going to be the Judas goat that leads their industry down the dumb pipe road if they agree. But think about think about what this could mean down the road. Let's say let's say theoretically. You mean for consumers or for the cable company? And for me personally. Yeah, Tom. exactly. I get why we love it. No, I, but you don't have to explain that anymore. <laughs> but imagine imagine if you could surf channels through live television from a decade ago. Imagine this experiment. Right. No, yeah, it's amazing. That would be amazing. Yes, I totally agree. I hundred percent agree with time you. Time machine of media. That would be yeah. incredible. And it will happen. It's just a matter of when. All right. All right, let's move on to Film Foul. Pow, pow. Uh, io9 always has really good season previews. They, they've kind of replaced the TV Guide fall preview issue that I loved in the 1980s. I now yes. go to io9 uh, to talk about what's coming in the new fall season. Uh, and it's interesting as the fall season kind of gets spread out. It gets smeared out. Some stuff is already airing. For instance, Grimm already back on NBC. Doctor Who, we still don't know for sure when it's coming back. We think September 1st, but Doctor Who's fall season is going to be starting pretty soon. Also, I didn't know about this one, Ridley Scott's Coma. It's a, uh, it's a miniseries that's going to be on A&E September 3rd and 4th with Gina Davis, James Woods, Richard Dreyfuss, Ellen Burstyn uh, doing the Michael Crichton novel. Yeah, I didn't. I have not read the Michael Crichton novel. I've read most of his other stuff, so I actually don't know. They, they sort of hint at a big surprise, what it means when they bring in all these people in a coma. Uh, and I'm kind of excited to, it's like in there is a gift-wrapped surprise, so I kind of don't want to know. 
Uh, the other stuff, a lot of it we've talked about, a lot of it you've heard about. Uh, Arrow coming to the CW. That's uh, that's the Green Arrow with Oliver Queen. It's the. I'll tell you what I noticed was I'm sure that of interest to you is that the very final season of Fringe coming up. Oh, yeah. Up, how do you feel about it? I, I got to admit, I accidentally read, I, I speak just enough Fringe to have accidentally uncovered some major plot spoilers uh, by reading this synopsis. And weirdly, it kind of makes me want to jump back and finish watching Fringe. Good, I hope you do, because I'm sad that this is going to be the final season, but I cannot wait to see what they do with it. Uh, they sort of reinvent the show every season, and, and this is definitely no exception. Uh, Revolution is the J.J. Abrams, uh, his, his take on The World Loses All of Its Power. Uh, the Neighbors on ABC, September 26th, about a family that moves next door to a family of aliens. All right, look, there's only one that any of us care about on this. You say it's pan down, Jason. Show it. Show it. Little the Vampire farther. Diary. Oh, wait. No, not The Vampire Diaries. You Community. Know Final Damn. season. Oh, wait. The Walking Dead coming back. And let me tell you, man, the more I think about it, and I don't think I said it at the time. I think I kept extending them a pass, saying that, like, I'm going to get back on board. But, like, I think I sincerely hated the last half of the second season of The Walking Dead. And that's hard for me to say since we had Robert Kirkman on and everything. But, obviously, they had a big dust up there. But having said all this, you can win me back. Just give me one. I thought you awesome. hated the first half and liked the second half. No. I, so you I, hated both halves. Maybe at different times. It depends on when you ask me. It was really right. complicated. A lot of hate. That have a very complicated relationship. Uh, as far as the uh, Deadline Weekly YouTube rankings, uh, lots of music up at the top. Motor Trend uh, took a fall. Uh, WWE Fan Nation took a fall. What are some of the big ones, though? It's it's mostly I, I Olympics. Some of the Olympics videos and music videos had a big week. So I, I got a question for you on on that regard. Like, is there going to be a time when we need to cut out looking at the the music ones? Does it become a sub uh, a subcategory of narrative fiction or or crap that's not music? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you always say that until they're no longer number one, right? I mean, that's right. that's just the, it was always it was that way on Thursdays in the eighties. Like, well, let's not look at the NBC comedies because they always win Thursday. What are the other shows doing until they're not winning anymore? So, so yeah, right. I mean, it, it is more interesting what's going on uh, down below and who's who's jumping. The Onion took a big leap up from number eighteen to number thirteen. Um, always interesting just to kind of check in on that. Let's move on to the movie draft. Congratulations, Justin Robert Young. You're you pretty much have tied up the summer movie draft. Uh, 933 million. I'm at number two at 699 million. Wow, did Paranorman disappoint with 14 million. <laughs> uh, the Expendables 2 only got 28 million. And Sparkle, I really believed in this movie, 11.6 yeah, million. Yeah, man, that's, uh, that's brutal. Uh, and that was the final week of the movie draft, by the way. Yeah, man, it was it was a hell of a ride. This has been an exceptional year, and uh, let's take a look. Let's give a tip of the hat to the winners of the Chat Realm Challenge. That's of course where you take the prices that we established in our bidding, and we had a four way tie for number one. Unless something crazy happens in the next twenty minutes with Madagascar Three, Europe's Most Wanted, it's looking like a four way tie between uh, I can't read all of it. Harry Potter something. I, Mister Chris, perfect face for perfect face for radio who's always in our chat room, is a tie for number one, Plutonium X tied for number one. 1,088,095,101. Congratulations to you guys. Out this weekend, the apparition. When frightening events start to occur in their home, young couple Kelly and Ben realize that the summer blockbuster season is over and it's time for horror movies in advance of Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> or something like that. That's hey, does this mean that next week we get to bring back uh, premiering this week? We yes. had some people upset that it went away. Premiering this week. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, let's talk about what we're watching. I mean, what we're watching. What we're what what. We're. So you were watching H Plus, you mentioned. Uh, what'd you think of it? Loved it. Loved it. And uh, it is gorgeous and beautiful. And I actually got angry that it doesn't have more views because we're a week into it. And they they did a decent job of building up buzz to this going in. It doesn't seem like the premiere episode should only be at 130,000 views. Uh, and it certainly doesn't seem 
like the fifth or sixth. Because if you watch them, obviously you see that drop off, right? The, the episode one has the most and episode two has less. And then it sort of flattens out. But it's like it's flattening out as little as 40,000 views for the later episodes. And every one is delightful. Every one tells a different aspect of this story. Uh, my only frustration, and maybe people are just holding off until they can really dive into it later. But I love what they're doing with the story. It doesn't insult the intelligence of the viewer, which a lot of science fiction has a tendency to do. All of the tech is believable for 10 to 20 years in the future. Uh, I'm really digging it. Have you watched any of them? I uh, watched the first one. I loved it. And I was uh, I had to break away. I didn't get to keep going in the playlist. And when I went back to watch the second one, there was an internet issue. Like, I couldn't get it to load. I, yeah. I was on holiday. I was on vacation, right? So... I, I, it might have been the hotel internet was was freaking out. It might have right. been blocked. They might have been blocking streaming or something. I don't know. But uh, I've been meaning to go back. Uh, somebody in the chat room did nail an observation that I noticed. Uh, Ob One Spiker says, "I like H Plus, but the credits are a quarter of the length of the video, and uh, that is so true. Like the whole idea of taking up airtime to explain to us what show we're about to watch is like, how can you not know what you're watching? Why do we need?" 10 full seconds of a placard that says H the digital series brought to you by Warner brothers or whatever. It's like, that's, that strikes me as, as very anachronistic from mm. what otherwise would be a very forward thinking series. So if you go to uh, youtube.com uh, search for H plus digital series or go to youtube.com slash user slash H P L U S digital series, you can find it uh, and take a look at it. It's worth sitting through that stuff that Brian's talking about to see the story though. I think. Uh, I watched End of the Century, the story of the Ramones, this weekend. How was it? It was just one of those things where we sat down to watch something, and that's what we picked, and it was awesome. Yeah? Yeah. It was just absolutely fantastic. A really no-holds-barred documentary. Uh, one of those documentaries that has no narrator, right? So it's all told through the interviews. Uh, yeah. But, but very revealing, like... They're talking about drug problems. They're talking about band arguments. They're talking about how they hated each other at some points and when they loved each other. And, uh, you know, a few few on-screen titles to sort of explain what happened to people filling in the blanks. Uh, but a, a band that I've always liked and uh, learned a lot. That's awesome. Is that on Netflix streaming? No. What? <laughs> how did you watch it? I watched it on K, the Canadian uh, network. Oh, in the hotel room, yeah. Uh, uh, ketamine. I thought you were high. Oh, you started, <laughs> well, high on K. I imagined the whole thing. <laughs> uh, also watched True Blood. Uh, I watched Veep, uh, just the first episode of Veep, which I found pretty funny. I'm not sure yeah, if I'll be compelled to go back and watch more, but it was a good time filler. Go go back and watch more Veep because, like, by the third or fourth episode, once you speak the language of the characters, it's a little bit like The Office in that you're less yeah. there what happens and more with who you get to spend time with. I think you'll dig it a lot more. And you were watching Man vs. Machine. Uh, well, that's a video game that I've been playing the hell out of. You've been and, watching yourself play Man vs. Machine. Uh, mainly, I wanted to give, and I, I wanted to bring this up here because uh, since we were last here, uh, Valve released a trailer, and man, we talked a while ago about the, the Valve cinematic, I forget what it's called, but basically the movie-making engine that they have. Uh, those guys at Valve really know how to tell compelling stories. And maybe we'll tack it on at, at the end of a little bit of it. But the introduction to the man versus machine is basically co-op for Team Fortress 2. But in this little two-minute vignette, it's like they hit all these notes of fantastic high noon kind of uh, Western storytelling. You get sucked in. It's like I will watch anything that Valve puts out as a cinematic for anything at all. And I think it's phenomenal to see this kind of cross-pollination between a video game engine and its ability to tell stories in this very narrow universe that are so compelling. I can't wait for the first truly successful video game movie. It's going to come. It may not come soon. I know the Warcraft movie's on ice right now, and they're having issues with the, attaching a director. I know there's lots of talk about Valve doing a movie, lots of talk about other houses doing movies. Uh, nothing's firm yet, but I have a feeling, because of what you're saying about that trailer and the way I feel about the uh, Blizzard trailers as well, there is such a kernel of great storytelling that can be done if you get the right people together and with the right sensibility. Uh, it could totally blow, blow us away. Uh, let's Absolutely. move on to feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio, yeah. 
Stewart wrote in to let us know he set up a subreddit for users to post and discover the best legal TV that's available online. Thank you, Stuart. Go to reddit.com slash r slash online only TV. A great way to discover new shows because new shows on the internet, because it's so vast, sometimes hard to discover. Absolutely. Tony writes to say that he wants to completely agree with you, Tom, about the Hulu Plus restricted content. No, you're thinks, wrong. Oh, wait. He thinks it's absurd that even if you pay for a subscription, there are still shows that are only available on the web. I understand the reason that they can't put everything on Plus is due to licensing, blah, blah, blah. But basically, he just gave a big high five to you and your opinion on uh, Hulu Plus. It's just that it's confusing. It's not It's not clear that I get more when I pay. That's my, That summarizes my problem. Right. Uh, Ryan wrote in and said, here's another legal versus ethical debate. Uh, the apartment complex I live in just did away with their Wi-Fi, forcing me to get my own Internet. I went with Comcast and was only interested in getting Internet. However, doing some reading and having my curiosity piqued by must-carry clear cam, I split my incoming cable line and hooked one side up to my TV. After scanning, I discovered that I do, in fact, get a few channels, my local network affiliates only. There are channels that I would have access to anyway via my complex's community antenna if they ever decided to fix it. I have absolutely no desire for any channels other than ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. Is keeping my TV hooked up and getting only these locals legal? Is it ethical? I look forward to hearing your answer. Uh, it's only illegal if the cable company uh, has terms of service that prevent you from doing it. And I know there's some must-carry clear cam laws that I don't understand that may mean that it is legal since you're paying for Comcast to get that that very basic service there. You'd have to look into the, the laws in your, your locality. Uh, I think it's certainly ethical, though. You're paying Comcast and the signal is on there and it's not scrambled. Yeah. You didn't do anything to, to like go out on the tree, on the box, on the pole to switch stuff over. It's coming into your house. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, there was this whole uh, there's this whole uh, campaign in the late 90s talking about, like, if you are receiving this channel and you don't have cable, you're a thief, you're a cheat. And meanwhile, like, I think the apartment that we were in just happened to receive like we plugged in just so we could get the broadcast channels because of the apartment. But then we received some other channels as well. And I remember getting into arguments. I'm like, hey, bro, it's not my fault that you're accidentally feeding me this content. That's your responsibility to to feed me the correct stuff for what I'm paying. It's not my responsibility to self-police and say, stop giving me FX, stop giving me CNN. Well, it could be, it's your responsibility to not hook up the receiver, though, since you had to well, take no, that. Well, but, but if you plug in, let's say, I mean, if you plug it into your television, uh, this is back in 90s terminology, right. if you plug right. cable into your television with the expectation of only getting CBS, NBC, Fox, uh, and then all of a sudden there are more channels, is you know? Do you have a responsibility? Yes, you should not. Look, you should look away when you're surfing through those channels. <laughs> All right, avert your eyes, Brian. Uh, finally, from John in New York. You remember last week we were talking about the story of whether or not uh, Ben Affleck was a big enough fan of the Justice League to helm that particular thing. We talked about how big a fan Joss Whedon was of the Avengers. John says, yes, Joss Whedon was a fan of the Avengers, but M Night Shyamalan was a fan of Avatar: The Last Airbender, Aww. which. I mean, that was an unfortunate kick to the crotch. Oh, all right, fine. Good point. And thanks, everybody, for sending us email to framerate at twit.tv. That's it for the main episode. If you don't want to be spoiled on Breaking Bad, go away. Shut your eyes and ears now. We're going to do that in just a few seconds. Uh, for everybody who doesn't want to be spoiled, though, thanks, everybody, for watching. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash fr, and we stream live every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m., Pacific at live.twit.tv. We'll see you next time. I love you. Did Sarah leave? Yeah, she's, <laughs> right, she's not there. Does she run as if we're infested with cockroaches every time we start to go spoilery in here? <laughs> well, yeah, well, cause she she was she's a cord cutter, right? So she only can watch it on Mondays. And since we record on Mondays, she always has she, she'll watch it tonight. And then we'll talk about it. I'll talk about it with her tomorrow. Right. Uh, but uh Okay, so the the line that I said was in the show, remember, was in the yes. preview and was yes. in this episode.
Yes, I, I did notice that. I totally thought of you. So here's the, the thing. You know, I, I committed adultery while I was on the road with my wife uh, or com committed adultery on my wife when I was on the road by yes. watching all the um, Breaking Bad episodes to get caught up. But in setting her up for this one, I was like, well, do you just want me to tell you what happened or do you want to actually watch it? So we went through like two episodes of recap and then I got about a third of the way into explaining the train robbery episode and I was like, I don't want to explain anymore. I want to let you watch last week's episode. So I went back and rewatched the the whole train heist, and uh, and it was so good. Even watching it a second time, I got all tense at the way at, at the whole heist, and of course that killer ending where he shoots the kid. Utterly surprising. We of course didn't get that from this week's episode, but I don't think I minded it. I think it was it was it was okay by me. I kind of dug that it was sort of a neutral episode that ended with a cliffhanger because we haven't gotten that in a while or the promise of something epic coming around the corner. My, my, uh, my friend Fordo on Twitter has been going crazy because she caught up on Breaking Bad. She didn't like the train robbery episode. She thought it was totally unbelievable. She said, I can buy everything that's happened to him up until this point, but this was over the top. And I was Are thinking about it. And I said, and I realized, like, I loved the episode because it's a freaking train robbery, right? And my yes. rationalization is like they almost screwed it up. Uh, the only reason they were able to pull it off is because of Lydia and because of Mike, which they didn't have in the past, uh, and their parts almost got ruined. And and so I, I I get what she's saying though, which is that was not a very Breaking Bad episode. That was like. The great train robbery episode. That was that was the Breaking Bad writers saying we want to write a train heist, and I, and they worked it in. This it. week's episode was a Breaking Bad episode, like to the core. I felt. Well, I mean, yes, yes, and no. There were some there were some definite problems with this week's episode. Least of which, or not least of which, is this is a second infraction. Breaking Bad. I'm now writing you a double plus warning on your science content. Uh, hey, Tom, do you know why we have? Surge protectors? Surge protectors. Well, that, that would be to protect yourself from a surge. Right, right. And, 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 like, for example, like a surge of electricity, like if you were to take two contacts and hit them together, there's like a fuse built into them, right? Right. So, so uh, when you see a close-up of someone turning a surge protector on, if you look, yeah. you see the fuse there yeah. uh, that is meant to protect you from any kind of, uh, of surge of electricity. Right, so so uh, maybe it's just me, but does that make it a little bit kind of take you out of the moment when they make a point of showing a surge protector being turned on and then proceed to do the exact opposite of what a surge protector would allow to happen? By well, obviously, Brian, you're not taking into account that there was no surge in the <laughs> electricity, that it was very, he very carefully modulated it so that it was only delivering enough electricity to melt the zip tie but not cause an overload of the fuse. I totally missed or it. Or the fuse was bad. So, it, but here's the weird part. From a directorial standpoint, I understand why they needed that that uh, surge protector to be there because if they didn't, then they'd have to explain how he's able to reach over to the plug. Yeah, but they plug. could have had an extension cord. It, it, well, I mean, they could. They could have, right? It, there, there's a number of ways to do it, but the simplest would be to turn it off, do the thing, and then turn it on and then go. That That would be the prettiest way. Unfortunately... It's just for a show that does a good job of, of explaining. Really, making, though, that's the thing that bothers you? I mean, I, I, I would submit that it is possible to do what he did with something plugged into a surge protector. I think uh, in the chat room, K-A-P-T Kipper says we need to send this to the Mythbusters. Yeah, and no, fact, exactly, exactly. Vince what, Gilligan what, has said that he would love to have a Breaking Bad Mythbusters special, which would be amazing. Actually, that would be pretty awesome. Uh, that, that kind of stuff, it... it it didn't even hit my radar this time. Sometimes it does. And if it's not egregious, if I feel like, oh, maybe there's something I don't know that would make it possible, I let it go in, the, in these sort of cases. But yeah, because because he wasn't creating a huge arcing surge. He really was just touching the context and getting a little heat. Maybe it wasn't enough to overload the the fuse. I well, OK, I, I don't think that's how it works. But uh, but regardless, I also I, I mean, the other thing is, would you be able to sustain the pain uh, and not burn your flesh to be able to do that. I mean, that's also quite unbelievable. Yeah. Well, and also, it, was it just, did you think, like, wow, sloppy work, Mike, when he says, I'm going to bail on this guy, and I'm going to leave him by just 
zip tying one hand to a radiator. Like, did that just feel very unmike to you that he was going to number one leave him completely unsupervised? Number two, that he would just just throw one zip tie on and be like, yeah, good enough. It's not like he's some kind of crazy science genius that seems to be slippery in every regard. Well, it's zip not tie like- is pretty. I mean, that's that's pretty common. What I what I what I was surprised is that he left him a hand free. Yes. Yes. No. I mean, the zip tying him to the radiator makes perfect sense. He's in a rush. He's going to be back soon. Zip ties are are, are really good for that kind of thing. Uh, but why do you leave him a hand free? You zip tie the hands together and then zip tie those to the radiator and say, "Sorry about this, but I'll be back." Yes. Exactly. Absolutely. That 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 felt that that's how t- I always do it. <laughs> uh, what do you think? His secret plan is, oh, by the way, how great was that awkward meal with... with oh, that was comic genius. And at Comic-Con, they said, we're going to have a lot more comic elements this year. And they are totally delivering. That was the most awkward horror. We were just cracking up through that entire thing. And uh, good on all three of those actors for being able to pull that off in such a brilliant manner. But yeah, okay, what is his plan to uh, keep the methylamine and make the money? I yeah. think he's going to offer his services to the guy they're trying to sell the methylamine to, which is to say, like, I am your gonna, I am your cook, I am Blue Ice, I am Heisenberg. You want, you need me. Give these guys their five million dollars each. Let them out. That's fine. Bring me into your organization. That doesn't seem very Walt as we know him now. Just, to, oh just- yes, it does because you know what he thinks. You're not giving him enough credit for megalomania. He thinks as soon as he's in that organization, he can take it over. I uh, here's the problem: is they don't have enough runway to develop that story. Though we're we're getting near the end of the entire series, and and whether I guess they're dividing up the fifth season into two parts, you know, this year and next year. But I I don't see him as that because at this point he's grown so out of control. And by the way, I did love the scene where we really came to understand why he was refusing to give up the meth business. That it's really just all about gray matters. And it made me okay that we're not continuing to develop that story since what we are getting are the aftershocks of what it's done to him to see this turned into a multi-billion dollar company. Yeah, I I agree. I think that's a good tie-in, and and we're really getting to the resolution of Walt's story at the end. How is he going to get to, what is it, Vermont or New Hampshire? I can't remember. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Uh, Why is he going to New Hampshire? Is he running away from something? Is he running for something? Uh, It's... I, I think he's going to be he's going to be involved in this new organization, but I don't know if it'll be in a hostile or friendly way. I think that he will essentially try to because the way Walt thinks is not as a conventional criminal. He tends to think in terms of um, uh, he just assumes everything works the way the rest of the world does. And I see him trying to institute some kind of protection of intellectual property, essentially some kind of criminal patent system to his version of methylamine because he talked about gray matters and what he lost out on was ownership of the patents and gray matters went on to be huge so i suspect he's going to try to essentially create a criminal patent for what he's done because what what i have is an idea let's license blue meth and create in some method to enforce it and i don't know if that's a case where you know where he's able to build in like a chemical lock that he's able to provide the the key to or what i don't know well, I, I suspect- I, I, that fits in with my my theory, actually, is that he goes to this guy and says, look, you know what you don't have? Blue ice. And you know what you're going to get from me? Blue ice. So you work for me now. You pay them the five million dollars each. I will allow you to sell my blue ice and I'll cook it for you. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't. And in Walt's it's- mind, he controls the purse strings there because he has, like you say, the patent. He has the valuable part. And this guy's a small, small player. Or he wouldn't, or he we would have known him under Fring. That just seems very conventional, and Walt seems very into unconventional solutions. Well, so no, it's know. not conventional at all for some cook to come and start try to dictate terms to a drug dealer kingpin. That's not conventional in the least. That's Walter White. If if, if we were making a steak bet, I would bet that you're off the mark. That's all I'm saying. I will bet you one steak. Yeah, one steak to the heart. If you're wrong, <laughs> no. I turn into goo and I die. Ah. Awesome. All right. I uh, can't wait for next week, but that's uh, that's going to wrap up our, our spoiler zone. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around to be spoiled. You We're the spoiled yeah. brats. You're all ruined now. Enjoy it, jerks. <laughs> You're ruined for life.